What's up guys, it's Don't Matter here, and today we're going to be reacting to Romance and Early... I said, I said and, didn't I? Romance in Early Japan. Best Dating Ritual? Question uh, mark. This is History of Japan, Part 40 from Linfamy. So we're almost halfway through the series. I think he's got 82 videos uh, in this History of Japan series. So almost halfway through. Uh, this one obviously kind of related to the last one, which was about sexual dynamics. Uh, and how courtship worked and, you know, so much cheating going on. Um, so, yeah, this is going to be interesting, you know. How did romance work in Japan? In the Haiyan period, I guess, specifically, is what this one's talking about. I wonder if he's, you know, going to be doing this for every period. That'll be interesting. Because, obviously, you know, these things change throughout history. Uh, you know, depending... I don't know if they changed as much in Japan, though, because Japan still follows Shintoism. Um... Well, now they're much more, like, atheistic, but, like, historically, they've always followed Shintoism, so I wonder how much has changed in Japan versus, like, a, you know, like, Western countries where you have, like, polytheism and the, you know, kind of the, the decline of religion during the Roman Empire and then the rise of Christianity and then the decline of religion again, um, where sexual dynamics probably have changed much more, I would assume, but I'm not entirely sure. So, anyway, link to the original video down below, and again, this is Romance in Early Japan from Linfamy. Let's jump into it. That the Japanese in the Heian period had a whole dating ritual with cakes and poems and secret creepy night's visits. If you think that dating today is complicated, get a load of what they did back then. The whole process started off with a matchmaker. By the way, we're talking about the elites in the Heian courts in this video, not peasants. The I mean, I mean, technically, I don't know about Heian culture specifically, but matchmakers, up until like relatively recently, like really the rise of teenage culture in the 50s, um, matchmaking for relationships was pretty common. Uh, like, th it wouldn't be, like, full-blown, um, you know, like, arranged marriages like you would have in the European nobility or in, like, uh, different, you know, like, the Middle East or India or places like that where, like, arranged marriages are, are very common. Um, <clears throat> but there would be a lot of, like, matchmaking by the women in society more often than not. Like, mothers would try to set up dates with, like, the... You know, if you were if you had a son and you were a mother, you would try to set up a date with your son and like some other woman's daughter. Uh, and you still see this a lot in Amish culture. Amish culture being very traditional, uh, where a lot of the 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 women within the Amish society are setting up who's dating who and stuff like that. The matchmaker would let a man or his <clears throat> family me. know of a lady who would be a good candidate. It's weird to us, but they were pretty lax about marriage between relatives. The only absolutely forbidden, taboo, what the hell is wrong with you marriages were between a parent and child and between brother and sister. There was a gray area which was between step-parents and step-child that was seen as wrong. But you know what? Sometimes love finds a way, and people did it anyways. They would hate Such couples Pornhub. encountered weird looks, but did not encounter mobs with pitchforks. Anything else was fair game. Getting Uncles, tired. aunts, nephews, cousins, all perfectly fine. All right, now both... Again, this is actually pretty common for most of history, most of societies. Um, this is how the clan system functioned in Europe, for example. And one of the ways that a lot of uh, countries tried to break up clans was by banning um, marriages between cousins and uh, second cousins and stuff like that. It was actually really common in a lot of European countries up until like 100 or 200 years ago. Families had to look at all kinds of factors to determine if the two were a good match. What was not a factor was the opinion of the couple. It was very much an arranged marriage for political, economic, or social gain. The woman's family wanted a good husband who had good connections that would allow him to rise the ranks in court, preferably a husband who already had a high rank. The man's family wanted a sugar mama, a wife from a family that had enough wealth and resources to support him in his government career. Daughters actually became more valuable than sons, you could marry your daughter up into a family of much higher status. It was harder for your son to marry up because the bride's family usually wanted someone of a higher status than them, not some. The funny thing is, this is <clears throat> how kind of sexual dynamics work, you know, regardless of arranged marriages or not, right? Women tend to date across and up social hierarchies. Men tend to date across and down. When it comes to specifically social and wealth hierarchies, I should say, um, the, the obvious difference being... You know, part of that is, like, just sexual selection strategies that men and women employ and what they're after, right? Women generally – and it makes sense, right, from, like, an evolutionary perspective. Women are looking for men with access to resources in order to provide the best chance for their children to have, you know, to exist. Men in most societies are considered the ones that are supposed to earn the resources. So 
Uh, they're just looking for somebody who's beautiful as it's a proxy for good genetics. So a lot of the time you'll see, you know, <clears throat> it's not entirely uncommon for a really good looking peasant woman to marry a, a lesser noble or sometimes even a higher noble or in some in some cases be the mistress of a king or something. Uh, but for a peasant boy, that is most likely not going to happen, right? It, it may have a, a handful of times throughout history, uh, but incredibly, incredibly rare, right? It, for most of human society, for most of human history, I should say, uh, it, it was a lot more difficult for men to jump social levels than it was for women, um, or, or at least it was for beautiful women. Uh, you know, if you were born ugly, then unfortunately, you know, sucks to be you. Some low-status loser. The Fujiwara famously married their daughters into the imperial family, allowing them control over the Heian court. Also, children were raised in the wife's household, giving the wife's family significant control over the next generation. Daughters of powerful clans had a bunch of men chasing after them. A common trope in Heian literature was the wife battle, where multiple men would compete for a woman's hand in marriage. You can see this in the tale of the bamboo cutter, which coincidentally I made a video about. Go watch it after this one. Okay, after all the discussion and negotiation, if each family swipes right, the matchmaker would set things up. You know, gather Just mailing like addresses and phone numbers. And the dating ritual would commence. The whole process consisted of an initiation and three visits. So let's paint a picture of our couple. Our dashing young man is Bob Bunaga. Bob and our Nara. lovely lady love is that. Nina Moto. Babunaga kicks off the proceedings by writing Ninamoto a poem with 31 syllables called a tonka. He writes something romantic like, <clears throat> I can't stop thinking about the shape of your sleeves. Were it up to me, I would crawl deep inside them and only come out to pee. <laughs> that seems like some weird, like, I don't know what that fetish is called. Um, but there's that, there's that, like, fetish. Uh, it's, like, really popular in, like, hentai and stuff where, like, somebody crawls inside of like something and it's i don't get it you know to each their own but it, not for me but <laughs> I, i'm assuming linfamy is into that because that literally sounds like something from that <laughs> after okay. experiencing that romantic fluid inducing poetry ninamoto writes a response poem in practice it was more common for another member of her family to write the poem someone who is really good at it this response poem is no joke. Nowadays, we obsess over the meaning of a smile emoji. Is it just a friendly smile, or is it a I want you to hold me down daddy smile? Sometimes <laughs> it's hard to tell. Well, back in the Heian, they did the same thing times a hundred. Babunaga probes every part of that letter. Every detail is important. Is the paper of good quality? The family must be rich. Is her calligraphy ugly? She must be an ugly person. Is the poem mind-blowing? She must not mind... He goes through every inch of that letter like a detective, gathering clues about the mystery girl. If Babunaga finds something unspeakable, like an ink smudge, he'd ghost her and move on. But the oh. poem is pretty good, so they make plans to secretly meet at her place at night. Let's call this the first visit, because that's what it is. Now, about the secret... So, so, it's like one of those things where it's like secret, right? I'm guessing, because if, if this is like a normal courtship ritual, then it's like one of those things that like... It seems like it's one of those things your parents know you're doing, but you you know you know, yeah. It's like one of those weird games you play where you're a teenager, where you know you're doing it, your parents know you're doing it, you know your parents know, your parents know you know, and everyone acts like it's not going on. Is it like kind of like one of those things? Secret visits. The lady's family was not supposed to know about them, but in practice, the family knew. They just employed the waiter method, where they ignored the man creeping around their home while yeah. looking directly at him. So the first night. <laughs> Babunaga creeps into Ninamoto's home, and they sleep together. Oh, I guess they talk, too. He leaves early the next morning, as is customary. What happens next is critical. Ninamoto and her family wait in anticipation, and then let out a sigh when a messenger comes with the next morning letter from Babunaga. The letter contains the usual lovey-dovey stuff, but the fact that it exists means game on. Last night went well. Ninamoto's family even rewards the messenger with gifts and drinks, and Ninamoto replies with her own love letter. The next night, Babunaga visits again for a second skirmish under the sheets, and leaves much like the first night. More letters. On the third and most important night, Ninamoto's family makes these rice cakes called Miyako Mochi and puts them in her room. 
people in the Heian got married without a big wedding or any legal paperwork. A couple. So, so this is like their their wedding is literally like if you eat the rice cakes, you're married now. <laughs> What if he just leaves them? He's just smashing and just bails and just leaves the rice cakes. Well, was married if their friends and families recognized them as married. That's it. The couple did go through two small rituals, though. The rice cakes were to honor their Shinto gods Izanagi and Izanami, who okay. were husband and wife, also brother and sister. Eating the cakes united the couple religiously, and the next morning the man could stay with the lady without worry. The second ritual was eating with the wife's family. Ninamoto's family organizes a small feast and invites Babunaga and a few of his friends over. They don't invite Babunaga's parents. This occasion does not involve them. The public feast is the first time Babu- that, That's kind of interesting. <clears throat> Why does it not involve the male's parents? Because, you know, you would assume, like, I, maybe it's just because I'm a Westerner and, like, we associate that with Western weddings where, you know, you kind of bring both families together. Um, you know, all, everyone shows up, right? Like, uh... You know, your cousins, your aunts, your uncles, your grandparents, her grandparents, her cousins. Like, everyone from both sides of the, you know, your family, her family, they all show up. Uh, I wonder why <clears throat> his family doesn't show up. I, I'm guessing it's part of the, because, like, the children are going to be raised in their household type thing. It's, it's kind of different, right? Like, because, you know, obviously, like, Western culture is very patriarchal. Um, and I, I don't mean that in, like, a negative way. I mean that, like, an objectively factual way. It's just, it is a... You know, Western culture historically, not so much anymore, but historically was a patriarchy. Um, Japan seems kind of slightly different. Like, it seems almost matriarchal, not quite matriarchal. There's obviously, like, a, you know, men have a lot of say in stuff. Um, but it is, you know, not nearly as patriarchal as, uh, you know, Western societies. Abunaga meets his wife's family. And with that, the happy couple is officially married, and he can see her openly. No more creeping about. Now, if you saw the last video about the Heian seduction game, you may be wondering where that fits into this dating process, because that looked a lot different. Well, it's the difference between a one-night stand and dating. The former was for fun times, the latter was for a serious relationship that may lead to marriage. Of course, like today, there was overlap between the two. What started out as fun times could lead to something more serious. And then your life was over. No. <laughs> Actually, that was how a lot of secondary marriages happened. They grew from something less serious. Marriages to secondary wives had a similar dating ritual, but those happened over long periods of time instead of just three nights. Whoa, we passed 50,000 subscribers. Jeez, I can't believe how much the channel has grown. Thank you know what's crazy? I'm pretty sure what's he at now? Almost 500 k so he's almost at 10 times that. Good for him. Um... Yeah, it's honestly, some of these things are kind of, like, some of the things are, you know, very similar to the West. Um, you know, sexual, for, you know, sexual dynamics uh, and what men and women desire seems to be re largely the same, right, regardless of culture. Um, in, in some senses, right, like, you could say some certain specific things might be different, but, like, generally the things that they're looking for is, like, the, you know, the, the kind of cliché, uh, you know, men are success objects, women are sex objects, right? Men are looking for beautiful women, women are looking for powerful and rich men. Uh, or I, th I think I just said men are looking for powerful and rich men. Women are looking for powerful and rich men, men are looking for beautiful women. Um, now, what beauty standards of the, of the society and what the success standards of the society are may vary, right? Um, but the underlying thing is still the same. But I find it fascinating how different the system of you know, you know, the the view on sexuality and the differences in like, you know, whose family is invited to like the, the wedding, for lack of a better term, um, the, you know, the, the marriage ritual, whatever you want to call it. Uh, because obviously, like in, in most Western societies, uh, you know, men are very much seen as or women are very much seen as like marrying into the man's family. They'll take the man's last name. The children will be raised in his house although you know he's also supposed to live on his own which is much different than like japan at this time where the man would often live with his parents the woman would live with her parents um yeah it, it's you know some things are very very similar to the west and some things are very very different i find it really interesting but anyway let me know what you think below like comment subscribe i'll see you guys in the next one which is uh marriage in early japan so kind of continuing this uh trend here see ya